Stan Energy Man here, Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, part of the State of Hawaii's Business, Economic Development, and Tourism Branch under the High Tech Development Corporation over in Manoa, and we do everything high tech. And I tell you what, last week I had such a good time talking to a boss, and we had a little bit of technical difficulties with the Skype cutting in and out, but uh, we just barely got started with a boss, and I got a lot of great feedback from the show. So. We've asked the boss to come back this week, and uh, so, boss, thanks for joining us again, and I really appreciate your time last week and this week, and uh, you really are, um, you have a, a way of explaining the drivetrain technology and electric drivetrains, and uh, it, it just seems to all make so much sense when you talk about it, and I think it just, it comes from your years of experience, and uh, you know, all the way from working on the, the lunar rover uh, projects and EV1, and you know, all your renewable energy background and you know professor the whole nine yards it just it's just a great conversation with you so you know last week we talked a little bit about your experience in in working in electric drivetrains and how technically they've really really come a long ways they've gotten cheaper and lighter and and, and more more speed production um, we talked about how the technical side of uh, electric drivetrains for transportation are, are really pretty much a no-brainer now. Everybody just takes for granted that uh, electric vehicles are the wave of the future. Um, and then we started talking a little bit about energy storage and batteries and, and uh, hydrogen storage and even uh, liquid natural gas or natural gas storage and using those for, uh, for your energy source. So maybe we can pick up around there and you can catch us up from there and, uh, and we'll just keep going into this discussion if that's all right. And aloha, Hawaii. Aloha, the Think Tech Group. It's a pleasure to be uh, uh, in your show again. And um, you're right. Uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to see the industry go from a science-based, feasibility-based uh, phase, whether we can do this thing or not, to a, to a level that now is all about economics. And not only is it about economics, but it's getting into talk about the social behavior. Uh, I am fortunate enough to see the impact that, uh, that, for example, companies like Tesla, and we used to get excited about uh, natural gas vehicles. Then we got excited about the new diesel with the PDF filter on them. Oh, I don't see that smoke anymore. I can still smell it now these days. Uh, I don't see it. I don't smell it, but it still is there. We went from a PM10 particle to PM2.5. So I've had, I, I really have enjoyed it. As I said last time in the show, we have come a long way. We have come a long way to establish electric drive as the most efficient. We have come a long way to say, hey, the best way to decouple tra traffic from good use is use electric drive. So now the industry is talking about energy source. What do we about energy source? The battery science, the battery market, the battery business group is spending billions and billions of dollars to advance materials. And we have come a long way on that. We, we even have standards now for batteries. And then on the fuel side, we have a lot of work on the hybrid side. And just like the way we are focusing on now, we are looking at the hydrogen as a source of energy. Bottom line, are we storing ion, like a lithium ion? Are we storing atom like a hydrogen? Or are we storing molecules like natural gas or diesel? That's really bottom line what it's boiled down to. But I, I, I have been fortunate enough to see that from a technical side. And these days, I am seeing that through a business, through a product, through something that is no longer a talk, but something that the end user can drive something that the end user can actually feel and touch. So, so from that perspective, it, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a hell of a good experience. So, Boss, do you think maybe that, that perspective is why um, it, it feels like 2016, 2017 were kind of a turning point for hydrogen, where, you know, not only have we, we matched the technical uh, challenges and met them and, and exceeded, but we're starting to actually have more people... Um, adopting hydrogen technology uh, emotionally and, and financially, and uh, they're willing to step into that realm. Is, is that why you think uh, we're kind of at that turning point in hydrogen? That's definitely one of the elements of turning point. However, the other 
ter- element of turning point, we have seen a lot of people getting excited with the power, convenience of electric drive. Now suddenly they are starting to notice the issues with the charging. Suddenly they are starting to notice the real issue with the range. Because if you're going to run a commercial vehicle, two shift, three shift, all that becomes the effect. So what is happening is that our end user are looking at the secondary now because they are beyond the first phase. Oh, is it going to handle well? Is it going to drive well? So these two hand on hand and the policies to support it has really helped this. A good example of this is China. China deployed more electric vehicles. Actually, no, before electric vehicle, China deployed more natural gas buses than the whole world combined. They learn about that. They went through electric bus, electric vehicles. They learn about that. Now they're going to hydrogen because they're saying, oh, my customer now has confidence. Now let's talk about their con- concerns. Think of electric vehicle satisfying the concern, giving the appetite of good performance, quietness, and all that, especially when it comes to buses and trucks and, and refuse truck and so on and so. Now, now that that anxiety is gone, let's talk about real business. I have a truck. I have a bus. I have a taxi in New York. They run two shifts. They run three shifts. Then I have to find a solution. That's where hydrogen really becomes to be attractive because it has the convenience of rapid charge, rapid refueling, without a major infrastructure impact, such as megawatt chargers and so on and so forth. And it has the convenience of the higher extra range, so you have less walk, drive to a station. So all of these guys have hand on hand together to do that. Just to give you a realistic picture, again, realistic picture, since the last nine years that we have been personally, me and the company has been involved with the fuel cell, our cost has come down two order of magnitude. So I don't call fuel cell, I call them combustionless engines. And we see that that cost will be coming down because technology for fuel cell, believe it or not, is not yet mature. Whereas technology for combustion engine, to improve it slightly, you have to spend a lot of money because they have reached a level of maturity. That is really what we're going to see with the hydrogen and the hydrogen engine, both from generation of hydrogen to consumption of the hydrogen and to handling of hydrogen. I think you're right, Abbas, because you know we've had some discussions over here on our microgrid just about diesel generators. And just the fact that you're going from tier two to tier four diesel generators and diesel engines and everything is a huge, huge concern for the industry because the cost is just going exponential on a diesel engine just to clean it up enough to meet the new environmental standards. Another thing we run into out here with uh, electric charging is we have older buildings with no charging units, and when they go to put the charging unit in, they have to upgrade the utility at the building, and that requires putting in a new transformer. And some of those large condominium complexes, we're talking several hundred thousand dollars to upgrade the electric delivery to that building to allow for more vehicle charging. And then, of course, the best time to charge would be during work time. And we still haven't got a lot of the employers that are willing to put in chargers at the workplace where they could charge vehicles up uh, at the best time for the Hawaiian Electric Company to uh, to absorb all that uh, renewable energy. So you're right. There there are some the secondary challenges are really showing up now in some of the other uh, in some of the other vehicles. And and this challenge shows itself more and more on the commercial vehicles because commercial vehicles are operating 12, 14, 18, 16, or sometimes 24 hour shift doing two or three drivers. When, when, when a ship pulls into the port, guess what? They have two or three shift crew going around it and so the whole ship is downloaded or, or emptied. But, but once the ship is gone, then it stays idle. But for the time it is there, all the assets should be used. And also, imagine this, if you have like a C 
CNG station, like a like a gas station, like a hydrogen station. Each user will only use it three or four or five minutes. Whereas if you have an electric uh, infrastructure, each user will use it four hours, two hours, six hours. Oh, you can argue, but nevertheless, you have more real estate, more frontal area at which the business could have the second customer pull in. When we, when we talk about Waikiki, when we talk about down, downtown LA, when we talk about Tokyo, that's exactly what it's about. I have limited um, the parking, and if they don't come, I don't get the business. So having said that, now let's go back to our discussion about trucks and buses, which they have their own challenge, because for the passenger vehicles, we can get 200 miles. It's not that difficult. We can get 250 miles. It's not that difficult because we can use carbon composite, other glass and reduce the weight. And the vehicle is only designed for four people or five people. That's it. But when it comes to a truck or bus, literally, you cannot put batteries on board. Now, we talk about the battery technology enhancing, of course. I'm hoping that the battery technology, we went from lead acid to nickel metal hydride to lithium. And before that, we had zinc air. Now we're talking about lithium air. And then we are talking about the space age batteries, which, which are beyond this discussion because of the cost. So bottom line is this, the commodity, the quantum physics associated with the battery is the same quantum physics that is associated with fuel cell. Electrode, anode, cathode, separator, polymer. Pretty much the same, except the fact that the fuel cell current density during the last five or 10 years, fuel cell power density for the same kilogram has evolved order of magnitude more than battery, even though the battery research has started 30 years ago, 40 years ago. That is why we are so optimistic that this combustionless engine, this static engine at which hydrogen comes from one end, oxygen comes from one end, and we literally extract electron from the hydrogen molecule. It could not be any more efficient. So we really see that to be efficient enough, not only that, which is more efficient already, last longer, which is not an issue because it does last longer, but cost effective. When we compare it with the engine and after treatment and a generator, because remember, in last, year, last, uh, last week we talked about it, the future propulsion is electric. When I have a combustion engine, I have to have a generator associated with that. That's called hybrid. With the fuel cell, we have that electricity generated. I am confident of this fuel cell engine competing neck on neck with that combination of the engine after treatment and the generator. Whereas a lot of people compare the engine Hello, with the fuel cell my name and is Chris. They, they look at the Euro 2 engine. Well, guess what? Between Euro 2 and Euro 4, or I'm sorry, tier 2 and tier 4. Between 2007, 2010, 2013 emission, Euro 4, Euro 5, Euro 6. Guess what happened on the evolution of the engine? Engine evolution was zero. All of that was contributed to the after treatment. After treatment is a catalyst. It's similar technology as what fuel cell is. So I am very optimistic in that. And now, believe it or not, we have more believer of a hydrogen engine or fuel cell engine, but now we have a major doubt in terms of source of hydrogen generation, delivery of a hydrogen, big business model. Like, like the day before yesterday, there was this workshop about from NREL about the model of a hydrogen station. How much does it cost? How much you sell and how do you make money? Otherwise, if nobody builds a hydrogen station, nobody drives a hydrogen car. So I am really glad that it's no longer a science. It's no longer a technology feasibility. It's no longer a technology demonstration, but rather a economy and bottom line to the end user. Okay, Abbas, I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break here and come back and jump right back on that. But... Uh... 
uh, you've kind of hit a really important point. We've made that, we've turned that corner on whether these fuel cells are technologically feasible. And I think we're even turning a corner on the fuel cell, I mean, on the uh, electrolyzer production, steam reforming, and things like that to bring the hydrogen around. So we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Abbas Ghadarzi talking about hydrogen fuel cells and particularly commercial vehicles. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward. And the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon, and let's move Hawaii forward. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians, or artists, to see how we can come together to make a renewable future. Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, Energy Man here with Abbas Ghadarzi from US Hybrid coming to us live and direct from Torrance, California. His main headquarters where he has just shy of 70 people on staff. Some of them work here in Hawaii, some of them work in California. He's got a, also got some operations over on the East Coast in Connecticut. And um, I've actually been to all of his locations to, to see uh, what he does and how big, of his, uh, how big his operations and how sophisticated they are. And I'm here to tell you, uh, as, as a person who's hard to impress, um, I'm very impressed with what Abbas has built uh, over the last few years to, uh, to encourage people to get into electric drivetrains and fuel cell technologies. And I'll be going to visit his Windsor um, operations in about uh, a, week, a week from now, a week and a half from now. So Abbas, um, let's, let's jump back to where we were. You were talking about we've, we've passed the technology, technological challenges and now we're we're going through the economics and, and the growth. We've pretty much got the fuel cell side going and we're, we're trying to work on the delivery of hydrogen and building of hydrogen stations. So let's uh, just wrap that up and then maybe we can talk a little bit more about you know, your experience and, and your expansion into the fuel cell business. Yeah, um, we got involved with fuel cell uh, in about 2000, year 2000, 2001. We supply a lot of components that went into United Technology Fuel Cell. It's called Balance of Plant, basically. And then um, uh, it was fantastic, and those are the ones who made, before that they were making, uh, people don't know that, but shuttle bus and Apollos are all powered the fuel cell. If you look at Apollo 13, they talk about my fuel cell problem. That is what it is. Anyway. In 2013, the UTC decided to divest that group. And uh, we being the believer of that, we put a proposal just like many other companies, and we, managed, we, were, we were selected to uh, actually buy that group. And at South Windsor, and the focus on a pen transportation. And ever since then, we have been focusing on development of this fuel cell engine. Now, here's what we did. Fuel cell, initially, the fuel cell companies, in my humble opinion, they overplayed fuel cell. Fuel cell actually is simpler than it is said. Believe it or not, fuel cell has a lot of common supply base as the engine. It uses a turbocharger, a blower, just like a turbocharger. Mm -hmm. It uses an injector system, just like an automotive. It uses a heat exchanger, we call them thermal management system. It's just a radiator. And then it has more electronics, but these days electronics is cheap. And that's what US Hybrid does. So what we did, we focused on producing this fuel cell for commercial vehicles. Now, commercial vehicles, when you design a product for commercial vehicles like truck or bus, it's designed for 20,000 hours. When you design that for a passenger vehicle, that's designed for 5,000 hours. 5,000 hours at a 20 miles per hour average of speed, that's 100,000 miles. That's how you get all your warranty, typical life of the vehicle, okay? Commercial vehicles are at half a million 
one million that kind of mileage. So when you design a product for commercial vehicle, that engine has to run almost full power continuously. Whereas when I put an engine in a Corvette that is supposed to accelerate only five seconds, 10 seconds, same thing with, with, the, with, the, with the Tesla. That engine cannot maintain it. It's designed to handle that much. There's just quick run, and then after that, the demand drops. So the demand on the design is much more severe. And that's what we are doing, producing this, both for U.S. market and globally. Of course, fuel cells that was developed, uh, many people don't know that, for the, for the pen fuel cell, we turn the system on in seconds, three to five seconds from the time you key on. Whereas if you look at the solid oxide or other technologies, which are hot technology, they can run anywhere between 600 to 900 degrees C. Wow. It takes them 12, 14 hours to turn on. Bottom line, PEM is the technology you want for automotive because it can turn on, turn off, and throttle easy, fast. That's what you use. And that's what everybody uses. Now, there are only three types of fuel cells for the pen. You either use carbon plate for anode and cathode, or you use metallic plate, a stamp very, very precise, and then you deposit carbon on that plate. That's what uh, Toyota does. But the life for that thing is not as long, but it is, it, it is a much faster process potentially cheaper, but not lighter. Now, when you come to carbon, now you have two technologies, solid carbon or porous carbon. So porous carbon is what we use. Porous carbon is like a sponge. It eliminates a whole bunch of components called humidifier. For a fuel cell to work, literally you have to create um, um, uh, steam, humidifier inside. With the with the, with the, uh, sort of a porous plate, you don't have that problem. It's just something called flooding. With a porous plate, we never have flooding problem. Whereas with the other fuel cells, you do. So what happens is that engine is more complicated, but then the surrounding supporting system becomes easier. Then the next question is, okay, now you build your anode, your cathode, and you put your MEA, GDL in between, now you have one cell of fuel cell. The question is, when you inject hydrogen and inject air from the other side, what is the pressure? Is the whole system pressurized or not pressurized? Ambient pressure. We decided to focus on ambient pressure. As a result, our efficiency, it gets into upper 60s, 68%, 67%. Also, because of the low pressure, all my auxiliary components are much lighter, lower power, lower cost. Guess what? Lower noise. NVH, noise vibration harshness. So these are the traits of we did with building this fuel cell for transportation sector. That's one thing we did. The second thing we did we made the fuel cell to act like an engine, mount like an engine, repair like an engine. I no longer have a computer-looking box. I have something that looks like an engine. I can actually remove the turbocharger or the air charger or the air blower or whatever you want to call it. I can actually remove that without dropping the whole thing. Right now, if you want to change a fuel cell on a bus, you have to lift the fuel cell, the whole bus, by six feet. With the new fuel cell, you don't do that. You just remove that part because that part is built on the exterior. So really, a lot has come through. And I'm really, really happy to see more and more fuel cell companies coming into business, whether they are U.S., which was the main originator of fuel cell technology, or Canada, which actually came from U.S., or Japan, substantial, or Korea, substantial, China. We're going to see a lot of investment from them in this sector. So I'm hoping to see more and more companies in this sector to be competitive market, to give a better value 
to the end user. Hey, can I ask you a question? When, when we talk about um, how the fuel cells have matured, and, and like you say, the challenge is kind of on the infrastructure side, um, one of the restrictions on um, the fuel cells, like for, for Toyota, are the purity level, five nines purity uh, of the hydrogen to get there and the high compression to 10,000 PSI. What, are, what do you see as some of the solutions there in terms of maybe lowering the pressure, <coughs> excuse me, and maybe reducing the purity requirements? Remember, we are running at 350 uh, more, which is 5,000 psi. Okay, because in a commercial vehicle like a bus and truck, I have more space. In a passenger car, I don't have the space, so therefore I go to high pressure. Guess what? It takes about 10 to 11 percent of energy just to pump the fuel there. Whereas when we go to 350, that overhead is like six, seven percent. It's same as CNG, so it's no different. Now, that has to do with uh, how much energy you need on board and how much space you have. With the buses and trucks, we really don't have issue with the volume. Weight is an issue, but we can have sufficient fuel to put in the tank, just like a natural gas, put it on the top of the bus and give you 350 miles. Okay. Also, let's get talk about purity. With our project, at the Volcano National Park. You know at about 3,000 feet, we have a high concentration of sulfur. Right around the volcano. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, so now that air is contaminated. We manage that. Now we have an issue with the fuel being contaminated. The question of a triple nine or five nine or four nine, we need to identify which one needs to be five nine. I can see us. PEM technology in less than two years to be able to manage one nine. Oh, wow. This is because as we go to a little bit of higher temperature membrane, so now I'm less sensitive to poisoning. Do you remember the low sulfur diesel and so on and so? Right. If you put a high sulfur diesel, it poisons the catalytic converter, right? Or after treatment. Right. That's the story. So as we go to a better, higher temperature membrane, they become less sensitive to poisoning. I can easily see ourselves to reach a single nine, and a single nine on a critical uh, um, uh, sort of a pollutant. But uh, some people actually are concerned what happens if, I, if the inlet gas, inlet air is just uh, have some contaminant. Really, fuel cell is much more robust. Okay. Hey, Abbas, that, that, that's really good news because, you know, a lot of us, when we're talking over here in Hawaii about the, the purity requirements, that, that's really a, a big deal. That's really a huge deal. So I, I tell you what, believe it or not, we're, we've already run through our entire half hour here. And um, so oh my God. we're, we're going we're gonna to have to have you back one more time. I don't know when we'll do it, but we'll, we'll probably give you a week break or two before we bring you back. But I want to thank you again so much for sharing uh, what you do with us because it's really, really a huge education for a lot of people. And I hope that uh, a lot of folks on YouTube will get to see this in the future and, and really learn a lot about fuel cells and what you do. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. And uh, we look forward to having you back again. And uh, until, until next week, I've uh, got to be Stan Energy Man signing off on my lunch hour. Aloha.